Good afternoon. My name is Vince Rock, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. The ABTA is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Upgrades on, Updates on the Low-Grade Glioma Registry. This webinar is funded in part by Agios. Please note that all lines during our webinar today are muted. If you have a question you would like to ask, type and submit it using the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Our presenter will answer questions at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will post to the ABTA website on the webinars page within the week. Registered participants will receive the webinar recording link in a follow-up email message tomorrow. In the next few days, you will receive an email asking you to take a brief survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a few minutes to share your feedback, which is important to us as we plan for future webinars. I'm delighted today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Klaus. Elizabeth B. Klaus, MD, PhD, is Professor and Director of Medical Research in the Yale University School of Public Health as well as a board-certified neurosurgeon working within the Department of Neurosurgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Her clinical expertise is in the treatment of glioma, meningioma, and brain metastases. Dr. Klaus's research is focused on cancer and genetic epidemiology with an emphasis on the development of risk models for breast and brain tumors. She has served as the overall principal investigator of the Meningioma Consortium, the Meningioma Genome-Wide Association Study, as well as co-investigator of the Gliogene and International Glioma Case Control Projects. Her most recent project is the International Low-Grade Glioma Registry, an effort to study factors associated with low-grade glioma risk, evolution, and prognosis. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Klaus. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much, and thank you to the American Brain Tumor Association for uh, all of its support over the, the years in uh, developing our registry. So good afternoon to everyone. I'm based today on the East Coast. Uh, I know there are a number of you because you uh, sent us an email or two before the webinar began that are uh, watching this from overseas. So whatever time zone you're in, welcome and thank you for joining us. So today's uh, webinar is to give a, an introduction to those who are not aware of the registry, but also to let those that have participated, and we're happy to say that there are over 300 participants so far, a little bit of an update of the information that we've gathered, uh, some funds that we've been able to obtain, and the uh, next steps that we're hoping to take. So to give a little bit of background, uh, essentially, there's not much information in terms of glioma in general, but specifically for low-grade glioma. Uh, most times when uh, low-grade glioma has been examined, it's been as a small subset within a larger group of all glioma. And so the American Society of Clinical Oncology has noted that the precise optimal management of these patients remains to be determined. So it's well known that we don't have a lot of information on this, and the goal of the registry is to try to gather information on low grade, not only to talk a little bit about the descriptive factors, but things like quality of life, uh, genetic risk factors, environmental risk factors, and how the uh, course of the disease might be altered by treatment, including surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And hopefully with that information, we can better guide patients. So some data from the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States, also uh, known as CB Trust. Uh, there's a nice new paper out, which is in um, collaboration with the NCI, or National Cancer Institute Connect Program. Uh, and that is looking at rare tumors, including low-grade and oligodendroglioma. So we know that there are approximately 30,000 individuals in the United States alone uh, that are diagnosed with low-grade glioma. About 3,000 new cases are diagnosed in the United States every year, and the mean age is relatively young. So participants or patients are really in the prime of their life when they're diagnosed. The mean age is 41, 
but we have people in our study that are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We do know that the rates are higher in males uh, and in whites. And so what are we defining as low-grade glioma? So this is important. We get a lot of questions on this. The study includes individuals who are 21 to 79 years of age. And we do get questions about why we have not included younger patients. And essentially, the feeling is that disease in terms of glioma for younger patients is very different from uh, adult patients. The genetics are different. The uh, pathology is different. So we wanted to really hone in and focus on adult low-grade glioma. Uh, so we've restricted it to 21 to 79 years of age. We do ask that patients, and so it does require a little bit of effort, which patients have been really great about sending us, but that patients uh, obtain and send us their pathology. They can take a picture on their smartphone. They can email it uh, to us. They can have their doctor send it to us. But we do want to make sure if we're organizing the study that we have uh, correct pathology for everyone. And so the three groupings that we're including are astrocytoma, mixed glioma, which also goes by the name oligoastrocytoma, and oligodendroglioma. And you'll see if you've been following the World Health Organization uh, guideline changes that the term mixed glioma, which was always thought to be a bit of uh, a little bit of astrocytoma and a little bit of oligodendroglioma that this category is probably going to fade away and not be used by pathologists. But we do know that uh, patients that were diagnosed in the past may still have that diagnosis. In terms of uh, sex, gender, race, date of diagnosis, or place of residence, uh, there are no restrictions. We do ask individuals that are outside of the United States when we send, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, the saliva kit to them, we do ask them to pay the postage back. So there is one little uh, caveat. Um, other pathologies that people ask us about, but we're not including at present, are ependymoma, pilocytic astrocytoma, which is primarily a pediatric tumor, optic glioma, and anyone who has a, a previous history of a brain tumor of unknown uh, diagnosis is also excluded. So we started off just including grade two, and this is grade two based on the World Health Organization guidelines. The newest guidelines do show, however, that the molecular markers, and some of these include IDH or 1P19Q, that those markers are more important in defining outcome or prognosis and even the type of tumor that you have. So we've realized over time and have been encouraged to include not only grade two, but also grade three. And you'll hear the term low grade, which typically means grade two or lower grade, and people generally mean uh, two and three. So the feeling is that you should include both of these to get a good feel for all the tumors that would be in this category and not leave anybody out. We don't include grade one, which is primarily seen in children. And we are not including grade four, which is also known as uh, glioblastoma or GBM. There are many studies that are focusing on that. So we wanted to focus on uh, the low grades uh, where there really isn't much work done yet. We are also now including brainstem gliomas. Uh, this was in part because uh, when we would go to ABTA and other meetings, these patients uh, really said they were not included in any studies. They are a glioma. Uh, the issue was that these patients frequently do not have pathology to present, and that's because the location of these tumors is very difficult uh, to obtain pathology from. So what we're having these individuals do is to confirm their eligibility by sending us an MRI image uh, rather than a pathology report. If they have a pathology report, that's great. We can take a look at that, but if not, uh, we will be able to include these patients by looking at the uh, MRI image. So these are essentially the people that we're uh, attempting to include. And we've been a little fluid over the, the years learning about uh, what the best group is to uh, include. So part of the reason, as I said, for including the grade three and the two is that it turns out that there are three, but there are more, um, but these are the main ones. IDH mutation, TERT, 
promoter mutation, and then loss or deletion of two uh, portions. One is the 1P portion of the chromosome, and another is 19Q. That if you know these pieces of information, i.e. whether the tumor has or does not have these characteristics, that these are better predictors of outcome than grade. So using grade, although it's still very commonly used, seems to be less important than knowing about these and other markers. So that's important, and we want to make sure that we get large enough groups that have or don't have these different markers. It also means that we're going to need a lot of tumors because we need to be able to subdivide the cases into these groups and see what happens um, according to various treatments by these different groups. So I've already sort of led into this. Why do we need the registry? Um, LGG uh, patients are usually just a subsample, and it's a very small subsample. When you look at the larger studies, it might be 10 or 20 percent of the entire data set uh, versus HGG, which is uh, high-grade glioma. And there really is no comprehensive prognostic or predictive classification for these patients. So we don't know how to best manage them. There's a lot of disagreement. Um, in the world of neuro-oncology as to what is the best thing to do, when is the best time to do it, and who benefits most from the different types of treatments. So we want to have, in the end, hopefully about 2,000 individuals and would like to get both germline. And so the way that we get germline is to collect uh, saliva and then also uh, tumor tissue. It's very important, this is something that we're working with other researchers on, to be able to follow people over time. And if they have more than one surgery, to gather the tumor tissue at these different time points to see what, if anything, has changed over time and also uh, by the treatment that the patient receives. That's going to be very important. So here are some of the, the goals. Um, as I said, we're trying to uh, create a clinical prognostic model. We're trying to find genes both that are in the germline, meaning in all the cells in the body, as well as specific to the tumor, and see how these things affect your outcome, your response to treatment. We also want to give better information to uh, LGG patients. So the one thing, and there's been a few uh, papers out recently, that comes up when we see patients is they're really not aware in some instances of what their prognosis is what genetic information is important to them and potentially to their family. Uh, there was actually a, the BTSM, I want to give that group a shout out. Uh, they were looking last Sunday at uh, family planning, and there's a nice article out uh, recently in um, neuro-oncology discussing what proportion of patients even have that question uh, brought up to them. Driving, uh, whether or not patients know uh, should they be driving? Should they not be driving? Have they had a seizure? What are the rules in each state uh, in terms of uh, driving restrictions? So just better information uh, for patients in terms of their everyday uh, living. Then additional goals is to try to uh, work with groups like the American Brain Tumor Association to get data on clinical trials to interested patients. So that's one thing that many patients say is, are there clinical trials out there? How do I find out about them? When are they paid for? When are they not paid for? Uh, do they require travel? Can they be done at home with a local neuro-oncologist? And so information on all of that uh, obviously would be very important uh, for patients to have. We want to gain information on uh, low-grade glioma quality of life, and we're going to present actually some preliminary data that we have on the first 100 patients, and as I said, to gather data on uh, changes in the tumor over time. So an important clinical question, which you may not even think about because usually people go to the doctor, you have a tumor, you're going to get it out, but it's not always clear that surgery is the best um, measure to start with or when to start with it. So there's a very nice article in uh, the American uh, Neurosurgical Association, and it essentially talks about should you have surgery at diagnosis or should you wait? And many of you probably know Dr. Mitch Berger, 
and Dr. Andrew Jaya. So they have sort of a point counterpoint where yes, you should always have surgery or no, you should not. Um, it does turn out that the extent to which surgery benefits a patient likely does vary by what tumor marker subgroup, for example, IDH. So this is still um, a question of interest. Is maximal resection the best thing, uh, which in general neurosurgeons do believe, uh, or is it better to, to wait? And are you changing anything? Are you reducing the genetic variability by taking the tumor out or not? Other questions, and this is a nice uh, paper in neuro-oncology, if you're interested in looking at what the different controversies are, and just raising the question that there are these controversies, when you have a recurrence, should you have surgery? Should you not have surgery? Is there additional information, particularly with respect to any genetic changes that may affect choice of chemotherapy that might be revealed? Or for low grade, are the changes relatively small? so you might not need to have surgery. Are the risks and benefits of chemotherapy the same for all types of low grade? And likely um, they are not, but we're just learning about that, and that's where it's important to have the samples collected at each surgery over time for us to learn more about that. So what's the benefit of our strategy? Um, so I've done a lot of studies over time, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, meningioma, glioma. And so traditionally, the way that we've done these studies is that we've identified registries, and they can either be a registry if there are enough cases at a hospital, or if you need larger number of cases, which you would for glioma, no one hospital would have enough cases. Different states have uh, registries, and they're usually connected with the National Cancer Institute. And you can see on the map here the states that do have registries. And so what we've generally done is contacted the registries. Uh, they're able to give you population-based cases, but the cost is very high. So for example, when we've done this in the past, the cost um, for a registry to give us uh, cases from one state might be thirty-five dollars or $40,000. The other issue is if you do not live in a state that has a registry, you're not eligible and you won't be included. So the idea now is to reduce the cost of using the registries and also making uh, these studies open to people without a registry, so just basically to broaden patient access. And it lets us move outside the United States as well. Another issue which many patients don't realize is when you do these traditional sorts of population-based studies through registries, you must require physician consent frequently in writing before approaching a patient. Uh, now, obviously, that can be helpful if the patient is not well and doesn't wish to be bothered, but it also means the physician makes the decision about whether the patient hears about the study or not. And so in the methods that uh, we've undertaken, the study is out there, patients can approach us if they uh, wish to join, and we're not approaching anyone personally um, you know, unless they approach us. So hopefully it's a, a bit of a win-win. It should improve patient access uh, to results. So webinars like this and publications would be available uh, to all the participants. And partnership with patient organizations like ABTA allows us to benefit from their administrative structure, reducing costs, getting information out there. So it, it certainly helps. And we'll show you a little bit later. We did a bit of a Twitter analysis. and. Uh, you can see how uh, great it is to have the support of these organizations because they're really um, able to reach a, a lot of different people, and through them, we're able to reach a lot of different people. Uh, the other issue is, amazingly enough, you, you kind of think everyone is treated in a large cancer center, but basically, the majority of glioma patients are probably treated outside of large cancer centers, and so if you're not at a Dana-Farber, Brigham and Women's, a Yale, you might not have access to information, and hopefully uh, by doing this sort of registry, everybody will have access to the information whether or not they participate in the registry or not. So I had already mentioned our goal uh, is to get about 2,000. We think with that, we'll have enough of each of the different subtypes to be able to say something uh, for each of the, the different groups. The other thing, um, 
our focus in this registry is not so much on environmental risk factors. So for example, whether uh, cell phone use uh, causes brain tumor or whether exposure to uh, chemicals causes brain tumors. A lot of that work has been done and to do it correctly, you do need a known population base, which when you do a web-based registry, you, you don't know where everyone's coming from. It's really random, whoever you happen to get to, who happens to see your study and be interested. But when you're looking at things genetic, you can control um, using statistical methodology for the genetic background uh, and therefore stratifying that to, to make uh, sense of what you're doing. So what are some of the considerations? Obviously, it's uh, hopefully less time. It's definitely uh, cost efficient, pragmatic. You do need involvement, as I said, of patient associations. Uh, we've had to learn uh, social media. We're still learning, and we have appreciated all the uh, efforts by an, a number of the study participants in helping us to learn. The access is not limited by geography. So you'll see we have uh, over 21 countries uh, now involved. We do have to be careful to maintain pra patient privacy. We go through um, the uh, human investigation committee at all of the locations. So they keep an eye on us to make sure that we're uh, doing things correctly, that the data are stored securely, uh, and that we're approaching people appropriately. Uh, another consideration is if you don't have internet, you likely don't see this study and it makes it hard for you to participate. In the age range uh, that most low-grade glioma patients are, the average age is low 40s, high 30s. Uh, the estimate is that over 90% of those patients will be uh, using the internet. But also, we have students that work with us. So if you do not have a computer or you do not have internet, um, if you call us, we're happy to enter the information uh, for you so that you would have uh, access to being in the study, even if you don't have access to internet or a computer. And we mentioned this before, but we just do like to uh, tell the international patients uh, that they, because of our current funding, we don't have a means for international patients to uh, be able to have their uh, saliva kits uh, paid for. It's about 5 to $10. It can be regular mail. It doesn't need to be any special mail, but it's ranged from about 5 to $10. We just got one from Australia today, and it was uh, $6 to send it back. So other considerations, you'll have both incident, meaning cases that were just diagnosed, as well as prevalent, meaning cases that have been diagnosed in the past. Um, I think our oldest diagnosed case is from 20 years ago, still going strong. Uh, so there's no restrictions on when you were diagnosed. Demographic representation, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And that's one thing we'd love participant uh, input on. The uh, patients that we have enrolled so far are primarily um, Western European, Caucasian, non-Hispanic, and we would love to get other groups involved. So. Uh, if people uh, know of ways that we might be able to do that, that would be great. Um, what sort of response rates? So it's interesting that even when people enthusiastically approach us, probably about 40 or 50 percent of those who approach us complete all portions of the study. And we'll, we'll talk about what the portions are in a second. So we'd also like to learn if there's any way that we can uh, help people or better advertise what the, the study is to increase our enrollment, but that is a pretty standard rate across all studies. Uh, and then another issue that comes up is uh, survival bias. So are you only enrolling individuals that are the long-term survivors? This is a disease with long-term survival, and our um, survival rates match those of the, the national databases, so it doesn't seem to be a problem. So where did it all begin? So I have to give a little plug to the American Brain Tumor Association. They were kind enough to uh, offer us space at their 2016 National Patient and Family Conference. And uh, they gave us space to enroll the first group of patients, did a little presentation. Uh, we had computers provided to us. Uh, you can see here, this is one of the Yale students who was able to get summer funding to come along with me and help enroll the patients. So this was where the, the first group, kind of the inaugural um, enrollment took place. So again, I have to thank the ABTA for that. So what are we requesting? 
hopefully um, nothing that is too hard for patients. The hardest part is probably if you don't have a pathology report in hand, uh, getting it. Uh, sometimes you have to go to the electronic medical records. For some folks, I know that's a little bit difficult, but if we can help, I well, would love to do that. We do accept any language. Um, we have uh, enough students here at Yale or faculty at Yale that speak pretty much anything and everything. Uh, so even if uh, our staff is not familiar with the language, we've been able to work with that. So any language is okay. Uh, online questionnaire. And I think it's relatively short. People have said they've been able to finish it in um, about 20, 25 minutes. And it just asks for some basic contact information. Uh, we do try to get a feel for if people have a family history and just what their um, treatment and then some questions on quality of life. And then we ask for uh, permission using um, a consent form to obtain a saliva kit. And so this is what the saliva kit looks like and a tumor sample. So we will get the tumor sample. We're not asking the patient to get the tumor sample, but we just need uh, your consent so that when we go to the hospital or write to a hospital to get the tumor sample that we can show that we do have your permission uh, to get a piece of the, the tissue. And we do, uh, for any tumor sample that we're getting, uh, we never use up all the sample. And pathology departments are generally very careful about that too. So we know that patients do want to keep uh, enough tumor uh, in the hospital so that if a study became open and uh, pathology was needed, that we do not use up um, all of your sample. We just take whatever is available uh, and, and go from there. So in terms of your pathology report and consent, you can either upload it to the website, and we'll show that to you in a little bit, or just send it to glioma at yale.edu. A lot of people just take a picture of it on their smartphone and send it to glioma at yale.edu, and that works fine. This is what the questionnaire uh, looks like. So it just asks you your age, and if you have a glioma, you can do it on a computer, uh, any kind of laptop. You can also do it on your phone. It, it's probably a little um, hard to do it on your phone, but you certainly can uh, and go through and, and click. You can do it on uh, any kind of Android or iPhone or anything like that. So we thought we would just review. Uh, this is a question that comes up. So if you uh, give us your consent and pathology, we will send you a saliva kit. And within the United States, we also pay for postage back. And the kit essentially looks like this. And the way that it works, it's not very glamorous, but the way that it works is you spit into uh, the container that's inside this plastic. And within your saliva are cheek cells. And from the cheek cells, we can extract uh, DNA. So you open the kit. And it's very important, this top line here, so you should not eat, drink, smoke, or chew gum or anything for 30 minutes before giving your saliva sample. Otherwise, whatever you eat, drink, smoke, or chew will end up in the saliva. And particularly if it's uh, food, remember that um, a lot of food, be it meat or vegetables, has DNA in it as well. So then uh, that DNA ends up being mixed in with your DNA. And that presents sort of a little uh, confusing picture for the, the laboratory workers. So essentially, you'll see inside there's a, a blue uh, kit. It has little towers, which look like a little fence inside it. We try to get people, and we know that it's difficult uh, to get it up to this, but we tell people just think of your favorite meal. Uh, in clinic, occasionally we've given people menus so they can look at their uh, favorite picture, whether it's a steak or ice cream, and then uh, put the cap on very tight. You should be able to hear a click. There's some uh, fluid in the top of the cap that is preservative, so once you click it, it releases and uh, keeps the saliva stable until we're able to uh, take it to the laboratory. And then you uh, put it into the little specimen bag and then into the little manila envelope, uh, which at least for the US folks should have uh, stamps and an uh, address already on it. And you can send it regular mail. It doesn't need to be uh, FedEx or anything special. Regular mail is fine. So to give a little bit of information, we have over 300 patients uh, to date that are um, completely enrolled. Uh, patients are from 21 states, uh, 16 countries, 
these are uh, some of the countries that are uh, listed there. And as we said, we talked about cases that are incident, meaning that um, they've been diagnosed within the past year. And prevalent are those that are diagnosed uh, longer than that time. So about 60% of the cases are incident. And so how um, do the characteristics for the registry compare to national statistics? So NCI is the National Cancer Institute. The um, population-based state registries that I showed you the picture of a little bit back, this is called surveillance, epidemiology, and end result registries. So those are population-based. And it turns out that our study characteristics are quite similar, which is good, uh, to the national registry with two exceptions. And this is very typical for any sort of epidemiology study. Every study I've ever done, this has been the case that more women participate than do men, and more uh, whites participate than all other groups. And so that's why we would, would love to have uh, additional non-white patients in our sample. Um, women uh, are at lower risk of glioma, yet we have a higher number. And that, that's just how, always true. Women tend to participate more in um, medical research than do men. The distribution of survival time, anatomic location, meaning where in the brain the tumor is located, laterality, meaning what side, and this is important because where your tumor is located can be associated with your neurologic function. All those characteristics in our sample match very well to the national registries. So overall, it seems that our uh, registry is very well matched to national data, which is good because then it will be applicable uh, with the exception of having a higher percentage of uh, women and whites. So as I said, the patients provide a pathology report. Some patients, and this varies quite a bit by what year a patient was diagnosed. And so in older years, sometimes uh, the pathology report will just say low-grade glioma, nothing more. Over the years, more and more information uh, is available and given to patients. So some patients give us uh, full genetic testing panels. Uh, some have a few genes tested. We're seeing that many now have testing for the 1P19Q code deletion, as well as IDH1. And I'd say about 70% of the patients in the study so far are oligodendroglioma, so they tend to have both these uh, characteristics. So this, uh, these data were put together by uh, Luke Benz, who's one of the Yale undergraduates uh, who actually just uh, graduated. And we presented this at last year's Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting. But just to kind of give you a feel for this, this is roughly the first 100 patients, uh, the average age, the mix of patients that we're seeing. So a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, uh, and then also spread. We have a few that are a little bit older. And remember, too, that some of these people, um, this might be their age now, but um, they could have been diagnosed 20 years ago. So as I said, about 55% of the sample is female. Uh, the majority is uh, white. Pretty high education uh, status, and that also is very typical uh, for participation in epidemiologic research that uh, individuals with higher levels of education tend to be more likely to uh, participate. So comorbidity just means other illnesses that the patients report, such as other cancers, a heart attack or a stroke. This is generally a young group, so it's, it's otherwise a very healthy group. So only about 5% of the registry participants report some other sort of um, a serious illness. And so what kind of treatment do people get? So this is um, radiation, chemotherapy, and chemotherapy, most of the patients received uh, Temodar. A few did receive uh, PCV, and it uh, seems as if that's becoming a little bit more popular given the uh, clinical trial results. But um, about 50-50 radiation, no radiation, uh, about 63% got some form of chemotherapy, 
and uh, then who had it on the left, the right, uh, and who had it on both. So a few more on the left than, than on the right. So we also have asked people about some of the symptoms that they report. And these are the different symptoms uh, that we asked about, uh, whether or not they had these, and sort of what percent had what symptom. So uh, it's interesting that 66% report being able to drive, but 20% say they can't drive at all. And obviously, um, that can be very restrictive depending upon where you live. If you're not in a major city, you live out in the country or suburbia, that can be extremely uh, restrictive for patients. Uh, seizures, so 84% were not bothered by seizures, but uh, patients, uh, the rest of them, a little bit to quite a bit. Uh, basically, 66% did not have arm and leg weakness, but that means 34% did have some form of an arm or a leg that was weak. Uh, a lot of patients reported, even if it was just a little bit, difficulty getting words out, remembering new facts, uh, headaches. A good number felt that they had some personality change. And a lot of times people would feel they could not multitask uh, as well. So if they were on the computer and they wanted to talk on the phone and they had to tell their kids to uh, to hush, they couldn't do all three anymore. They had to do one at a time. Uh, about 40% report some sort of vision trouble, uh, sensation, and 60%, although it varies uh, to what extent it is reported, reported some trouble thinking. And again, uh, it, it was generally uh, sort of a, a multitasking sort of scenario. Things had to be done one step at a time and also a little bit of uh, memory problems. So you can see here that there actually are a, a pretty high number of symptoms uh, that are reported by patients. We also asked about reported quality of life. So the instrument that we used is the MOS uh, SF36. It's a very well-known uh, instrument to study quality of life. And essentially, the score is from 0 to 100. A higher score is a better score, meaning that you're doing better in these different domains. And we have three groups here. So just to explain a little bit, the LGG are the patients from the registry. The meningioma uh, cases are from my meningioma case control study. And one thing to remember about meningioma patients is it's a benign diagnosis but the patients are a bit older. So the average age for the glioma patients, as you saw, was uh, about 44. For meningioma, it's about 57, so just keep that in mind. And then the controls are people who had neither a meningioma or a low-grade glioma, but they were from the meningioma study, so they're a little bit older too. So you can see here the physical functioning, the low-grade uh, folks are doing better, but that's in part because they are younger uh, than these other people. Same for bodily pain, but all had some issues with social functioning, lower values for emotional, mental health, their concept of their general health, their vitality, um, and just reporting a, a number of issues with how they felt and the emotional um, told that it, it took upon their lives. So certainly um, a marked reduction from control populations and even from a benign uh, tumor population. So what is uh, new over the past year? Well, we've had some great luck. Uh, we want to thank the Stop Brain Tumor Group in the Netherlands from um, offering us funding as well as the Loglio Collective, which is the Dibiri family. And we've also been able to develop, uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, the National Cancer Institute has developed uh, an NCI Connect program. And so what they have done is they have decided to focus on 12 rare central nervous system tumors. And uh, one of them is oligodendroglioma as well as anaplastic oligodendroglioma. And so they have partnered with us to help us enroll patients they also uh, offer for individuals that are interested in entering into their clinical trials. They generally do pay for travel to NCI, 
and there's uh, usually a housing stipend. So they have offered to help us with the uh, genotyping of the samples, which obviously is a great help to us in terms of uh, cost. So some, some nice new partnerships. So we, we do want to thank all of those folks for helping us with funding or with services or just general support and bringing us together with other groups. We're also uh, partnering, and we have a, a paper that's been submitted with a group that is led by Dr. Roel Verhock. Uh, he's uh, based at Jackson Labs. And so this is called GLASS, the Glioma Longitudinal Analysis. And so uh, we are partnering together. Dr. Verhack and I just submitted a grant to NIH. But basically the goal, which is one of our goals, but it's the main goal for this GLASS group, is to study the evolution of these tumors. And they're looking at both high and low uh, gliomas over time and by treatment to see are there treatments that would better suit some types? Are there treatments that are not helping and, in fact, may be hurting uh, patients? And so that is the goal of this. We have a, a paper that's in review right now. And so uh, once that hopefully is accepted, uh, we'll let all participants know about it so that they can have access to it, because I think it will be informative for both low and high-grade glioma. The other thing that we're working to do, and we've had some conversations so far, we know it's confusing for patients when we're studying uh, low grade and other groups are studying that. So we're trying to better integrate with groups like Oligo Nation, which is focused on oligodendroglioma, uh, the Musella Foundation, so that we're all working together and patients don't have to apply to three groups, four groups, you know, send specimens, fill out questionnaires for multiple groups. We're all trying to do the same thing. So we are trying to integrate uh, a little bit better. And if you know of other groups out there, um, we'd love to integrate with them as well. So we did want to, again, uh, give a shout out to the BTSM uh, community. They were kind enough to let us uh, present our registry uh, back on uh, March 4th, 2018. The analysis that you see here is by one of our uh, outstanding Yale Biostatistics uh, master's students, Jose Feliciano. And this is uh, data from Twitter. And so this basically shows you this was the activity during this tweet chat, which is sort of an hour-long effort where people speak through Twitter to ask questions on a given topic. And so this was our turn to have our first tweet chat. But to see the different connections between uh, all the different groups and uh, who's connecting with who. And this is very helpful for a group like us to know who, who are the main uh, stakeholders, who should we be connecting with to reach out to other patients, to other groups. Uh, so very, very helpful to see that. And then this, I know it's a little bit busy, but we tried to get uh, everybody in here so that everyone could see their name. Uh, this is another Twitter network analysis, but it's taking all the times in which glioma and hashtag glioma was used on Twitter in the year 2018. And again, our star student, Jose Feliciano, created this. And showing all the interconnections, and this is just on Twitter, between different groups. So you can see here ABTA, some of the other groups, uh, our registry. You can see some of, I'm sure, some of the patients watching. You can uh, find yourself in here uh, and the different groups, but very helpful to know who connects with who, how can we best get the word out there, who should we partner with. And it helps us know, are we getting the word out to uh, where we need to? Or are there certain areas that we're not reaching and we need to better approach uh, those groups or those people, those organizations. So how do you join the study? Uh, you can contact us directly at glioma at yale.edu, and we'll tell you how to go about and do things. Uh, you can, with your phone, uh, scan this in, and that will take you to the site. There's also, uh, if you type in International Low Grade Glioma Registry, we have a website, and the ABTA also hosts our um, our website as well. So any of those 
uh, are ways to enter the study. And how can you help? Just tell tell people any any mode, any way, old fashioned, new fashioned, social media. Um, just you're helping us uh, get the word of the study out there. And we ask you when you sign up, and we can see that some of you have been very active in, in helping us. So we do want to thank you uh, for getting the word out there. And I also have to uh, thank the people that have supported us. So these are three uh, students. Jose Feliciano is up here. As I mentioned, he's getting his Master of uh, Public Health and Biostatistics. He's been helping us analyze a lot of the social media uh, data. Uh, Emily is uh, a recent graduate of the uh, Yale Master of Public Health uh, program. This is her graduation picture in uh, beautiful downtown New Haven. She's working at Brigham and Women's Hospital with me this summer as a summer intern. Uh, helping to enroll patients. So if you're at uh, Dana-Farber or Brigham and Women's or any of the hospitals in the Longwood area and you see Emily, hope you'll, you'll stop and join us. And then I have to thank uh, Luke Benz, who just graduated uh, Yale class of 2019. He was uh, extremely helpful in uh, helping us to run the study. He was supported by the Michael Manzella Foundation. And we have to thank American Brain Tumor Association, uh, National Brain Tumor Society, Loglio Collective, DeBerry Family, and the Stop Brain Tumor uh, Now group uh, for funding. So as I said, uh, contact us if you have any questions. And also, I'm happy to, at this point, uh, if there are questions, to address them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Klaus. We will, of course, now take questions. If you have a question you would like to ask, please type and submit it using the question box in the webinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So as questions come in, I will start off with a couple questions we've already received. Uh, so Dr. Klaus, we sometimes receive questions here at the ABTA about hereditary aspects of brain tumors, including gliomas. Um, we've had people contact us saying, I've been diagnosed with a glioma, um, my father was and my child was, uh, what's going on with that? And uh, one of our, one of our uh, viewers today asked about the hereditary aspects of low-grade gliomas. Is this something that the registry asks questions about? And um, if not, what can you tell us about it? So it's a great question. Um, there is an increased risk of glioma among family members of a person with glioma. However, because the overall risk of glioma is so low, it's generally not thought that there's any need to screen family members. That being said, however, we do see a small number of families where, as you mentioned, one or more family members have a glioma. So we actually partner with uh, Melissa Bondi, so that's Dr. Melissa Bondi, at the GLIO gene, so that's G-L-I-O-G-E-N-E -E study. And so that is a worldwide effort to identify, collect, and enroll families with multiple family members with glioma. And we actually have found already one gene associated with families that have glioma, and we're looking for more. We also are trying to see, do individuals that have what might be thought to be an inherited tumor respond differently to uh, treatment than patients that don't have any family history? And yes, we do ask about um, family history in our questionnaire as well. And what we do is when we see that, we ask the patient if they'd like to be enrolled into uh, gliagene or we give them the information. Thank you. Another question just came in uh, about registries for children, um, and so specifically LGG, and if there isn't one currently, uh, if this current registry uh, is as successful as you hope it to be, any plans for another registry for pediatric low-grade gliomas? So we, at the present, we, in part because we're restricted by our IRB, it's only in adults. There is registration of uh, some of the glioma pediatric tumors 
through the NCI Connect program that I mentioned. So if you were to go on the web and type in NCI Connect and go to that program, they are collecting uh, some of the pediatric glioma tumors. So if, if people were interested in registering. So we're not going to try to duplicate what they're already uh, doing, but the NCI has already started that process. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a little bit about um, other other organizations that collect data on brain tumors. Can you talk a little bit about state registries and, and, and uh, how they collect data and make use of that data and, and how that might impact your work? Absolutely. So the state registries, and we've used them quite a bit for many of our studies. And in fact, um, in Connecticut, it's the oldest tumor registry in the country. So all of these state registries are supported by the National Cancer Institute. They're population-based, and so that's nice in the sense that you know the baseline population from which your demographic statistics are coming. They don't collect any uh, saliva or, in general, tumors, so they don't have any of those samples. And there's no questionnaire data, so it is essentially demographic data, whether or not they got radiation, yes, no, chemotherapy, Yes, no. And they are now, uh, through the work of Carol Kritschko and CB Trust, they are now going to attempt to collect marker information. And by that, I mean IDH, 1P19Q, and some of the other markers. So they don't have questionnaire data, and they don't have any of the biologic uh, specimens, which is in part why we're doing our work, because you need to have that data to actually say what's happening to the tumor. Thank you. Um, one of our one of our viewers is a healthcare professional and is wondering um, what is the best way that she can let people know about the registry. Um, do you have any materials to hand out, or is it mostly online promotional materials? It's online, but we do also have uh, brochures and handouts, and we would be more than happy to send our materials to uh, anybody that thinks that they're you know patients would be interested. So if you contact us at glioma at yale.edu, we can, we can hook you up. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned on an earlier slide that there are a couple glioma tumors that are not included in the LGG registry. Uh, one person asked specifically, why is ependymoma not included in the registry currently? Ependymoma and the others that we mentioned are not because they're thought to be very different than the gliomas that we're including. So the gliomas that we're including essentially are located in the, the hemispheres, whereas the cell type for the ependymoma is a different cell type, and, and that's true for some of the others that we mentioned as well. So we don't want to have a heterogeneous group of lesions that we're looking at. We want to have a very homogeneous group so that when we look at it, We'll have good information specifically for that group. And ependymoma actually, I believe, is one of the tumors that NCI Connect is, is looking at. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks once again to Dr. Klaus for her wonderful webinar presentation. Aside from our educational webinar series, the ABTA has a variety of programs that help support patients and caregivers on the brain tumor journey. The ABTA National Conference brings together patients, caregivers, researchers, and medical professionals from around the country to network and gather up-to-date brain tumor information through first-class educational programming. Join us in person in Chicago, Illinois, or via our live streaming platform this September. For more information and to register, visit abta.org slash national dash conference. ABTA also hosts regional patient and family meetings across the country. Check out our website to find a meeting near you. And actually, Dr. Klaus will be co-chairing uh, our regional meeting in Boston on October 5th. So anybody in the Boston area, please keep a lookout for that. Yeah, come uh, join anyone, us, please. Yeah, please join us. If anyone would like to get more involved with the ABTA and meet other brain tumor patients and caregivers, 
The ABTA's Breakthrough for Brain Tumors 5K Run and Walks currently take place in 10 cities throughout the U.S. We're gearing up for our fall events, and we would love to see you there. Please learn more by visiting bt5k.org. That's bt5k.org. For more information about ABTA's programs, events, and services, visit our website, abta.org, email us at info at abta.org, or call the ABTA Care Line at 800-886-2282. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and please be sure to complete the evaluation survey you will receive within the next two days. Thank you again to Dr. Klaus for a great webinar. You may now disconnect. <laughs>